So there's the call to yield the body to God in chapter 6. Verse 16 it says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are whom you obey. Whether sin unto death or obedience to righteousness, whoever you yield yourself to, you indicate that's your master. So he says, in effect, yield yourselves to God. The end of verse 19, yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, what? Know ye not that your body is the what? Temple of the Holy Spirit. Dwelling within our humanness, dwelling within this flesh, is the Holy Spirit dwelling in our redeemed soul. That redeemed soul, that ever-present spirit, is encased in our humanness. It is in that humanness that sin finds its expression. That is why Paul says in Romans 7, When I sin, it is not I, not that redeemed soul, but sin that is in me. Where? In my flesh. And I don't want to go all the way back through Romans 6 to 8. You can check that out in the tapes as you wish. But suffice it just as a reminder to say what we learned there was that the soul is redeemed, the spirit is redeemed, it exists within a body of flesh which has a bent towards sin. That's why we are still waiting for the redemption of that body and the receiving of a glorified body that doesn't have that bent. But until then, we still struggle with sin. And that's why Paul says, with my, with my redeemed self, I desire the law of God. With my body, I serve the law of sin. So what we have to do then is take that body and offer it to God as a living sacrifice. We cannot offer it to the world. We cannot offer it to its own desires. We cannot allow its lusts and passions to run rampant. Our redeemed spirit, already his, must make a presentation to God of our body. Such an important thing. Such an important thing. And Paul writing to the Thessalonians, every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of evil desire like pagans who know not God. And again he's saying the same thing. You who are redeemed must know how to possess your body. How to take hold of your body, which he calls in Philippians 3.21, this vile body. And he says there we long to get rid of this vile body and to be fashioned like unto Christ's glorious body. We long for that, don't we? But until that time comes, we must present these bodies a living sacrifice. And frankly, it is, it is a fearful thing the way the body can dominate the redeemed soul, isn't it? It's fearful. Here we are, redeemed creatures, with redeemed souls, transformed inner man, indwelt by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the almighty God living in us, and yet, isn't it remarkable how much power is still there in the body? to retard, as it were, the work of the Spirit, to dominate the redeemed soul. The body is the center of desire. The body is the center of disease. And it must be brought into subjection. It must be offered to God as a living sacrifice. And it must be continually offered, continually presented. Paul gives us an insight into the difficulty of this in 1 Corinthians 9, where he says in verse 27, he says, I keep control of my body and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Here he says, I preach and I represent Christ. 
And in order to do that effectively, I have to control my body. That human part of me that wants to surge with its desires and take control. The body has tremendous power. I heard just in the last couple of days about a very well-known and prominent servant of God who has become a castaway because he did not bring his body under subjection and immorality has destroyed his ministry. It is not uncommon, tragically, even in those who minister, to say nothing of those who are ministered to. Now, it's important at this juncture to say a word about this in the Greek culture. The Greeks took a very low view of the body. They depreciated the body. They had a dualistic philosophy that said spirit is good, body is bad. Don't worry about the body. It's just the body. It's nothing more, so let it do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't mean anything. It's the mind. It's the spirit that is the part of man that matters. But God doesn't take that dualistic view. God doesn't just throw away the body or slough off the body or ignore the body. I've even heard preaching that says we should never discipline in the church. Because when you're disciplining Christians, all you're doing is disciplining their unredeemed body. And you've got to let the unredeemed body do what the unredeemed body is going to do anyhow. So why discipline an unredeemed body? What else do you expect out of an unredeemed body? And it isn't their new creation doing it, it's only their unredeemed body doing it, and you can't correct an unredeemed body. Well, the answer to that biblically is, you can bring an unredeemed body under the subjection of the power of the Spirit of God. And the body can become, according to Romans 6, an instrument of righteousness. It can, and it does. Whenever your body is used for the purposes that are divine, it becomes an instrument of righteousness. Whenever it is used, or whenever it is, it is fulfilled in something that displeases God, it is an instrument of unrighteousness. So God does not just slough off the body and say, well, the body is only the body. That kind of dualistic viewpoint is not tolerated in Scripture. And it is also important to note, too, that vice was so rampant in those days, much like it is in our day, that people tended to be tolerant of those kinds of sins. And people today do as well. I am absolutely amazed at how many Christians will go and watch a movie that is filled with adultery. I'm amazed by it. I'm amazed that people will sit in front of a television and watch a film or a program that is all about adultery or a soap opera or whatever. Or listen to music that's, that is sung about fornication or adultery, even those terms, although those terms aren't used. I'm amazed at that. But we have all become uh, sort of um, mesmerized by our system. And we have learned to tolerate those kinds of things. They're not so bad. They're not so distasteful to God. They're sort of normal and tolerable things. And that's why we need to be refreshed in what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 12 and 13. He says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I will not allow myself to become a victim of anything. And then he goes on at the end of verse 13 to say, the body is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. The body is not something that's just for fornication and evil, so let it alone. The body is for the Lord. He can't work through you unless he works through your body, isn't that right? If you're going to speak, you've got to speak through your mouth. If you're going to hear, you have to hear through your ear. If you're going to see, you have to see through your eyes. If you're going to go, you have to go with your feet. If you're going to help, you have to help with your hands. If you're going to think, you have to think with your mind. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Not only is the body for the Lord, did you get it? But the Lord is for the body. He wants it. So there is no sanctification at all which does not include the body. There's no sanctification which does not include the body. 
And that is why 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his prayer. I pray not only for your spirit and soul, but your body as well. Before you were regenerated, the body was what expressed the, the old nature. Now that you're in Christ, the body is what is expressive of the new nature. That's God's desire. And so part of offering ourselves as a living sacrifice is offering the body. Now what does it mean to offer the body as a living sacrifice? Well, it's just a contrast with the Old Testament. They offered the body of an animal as a dead sacrifice. 